Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I think I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think this may be the uh, actual first seminar that we have in the completed version of this room. Uh, so I have the pleasure of, of inaugurating a new conference space. Um, so uh, today we have a division seminar uh, from Anker Lottelet, who I, I'm sure many of you already know. Uh, he's been with Yuri now for about two and a half months, and he's been given kind of an impossible task. Uh, he had to jump in uh, and, and take some of the work left by Axel Kinini when, when he moved on to another position. In, in a very challenging project uh, called the uh, Global Futures Project, it's led by Hipcrete. And they have a very ambitious set of uh, deliverables in a very short period of time. Uh, so he will uh, present some of the work that's been done under that project. Uh, it is something that they have tried to do very, very quickly. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity for feedback on the work that they've done. Uh, that has been under a team led by Sam Monty. Uh, Conker, just as a little bit of background, uh, he was with the uh, National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, he, he did his master's and his PhD there, and he also uh, continued as a postdoc. And uh, prior to that, he, he spent a decade at the Bangladesh uh, Public Administration Training Center. And he, his prior work has been on the, the garment industries, uh, the hand loom industry, um, handicrafts, and uh, non-farm rural activities. So he's actually just jumping into agriculture as well. So it gets a very steep learning curve. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I invite uh, Michael to, to give his seminar. <laughs> Very well, colleagues, thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome all of you to my presentation. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. My topic is X and D impact assessment of a combination of cloud and submergence tolerance like analysis in the questions of climate change. Um, <coughs> actually, this is a kind of joint paper done by me, Professor Dirk, and Dr. Lee, and Sam Monty. And I'm going to present here. Let me start with the last slide. Very basic statistics about rice was all known about this. Rice is the major staple crop in the world that is cultivated in 150 million hectares annually, at least in 114 countries in the world. And it is a kind of primary source of income for one fifth of total population in the world. And is a major dietary energy and major dietary protein source in many of the developing countries in the world. And it shows that. Particularly in Asia, the calorie intake from rice ranges from 30 to 18 percent. And importantly, the 90 percent of rice is produced by only, I mean, the small farmers who are 200 million in number, approximately. Not only that, there's a very serious coincidence about rice and poverty. About 50 percent of total poor people who are absolutely poor, that they live on 1.5 US dollar per day, the 50 percent of them are living in the areas but rice is a major, major crop. So this is all about rice statistics. The important point is that the demand for rice is increasing in the world because of two reasons. One is population pressure, and another is income increase in the major rice consuming countries in the world, such as China and India. So it is said that for one billion additional population in the world, additional 100 million tons of rice is prepared annually. This is one thing. Another thing is that income pressure. Some of the countries like Bangladesh, India, China, income is steadily increasing because of the growth rate of GDP, steady growth rate of GDP. And this causes serious demand increase. For example, in India, it requires to produce extra 2 million tons for the next 20 years, only to meet the domestic demand in India. And 
Using IGRM, Mohanty et al. they demonstrated that in 2035, the global demand for rice will increase by 17% to the level of 2011. So this all means we have to produce more rice to ensure food security of the billions and to ensure the income of the millions. Now the question is, how can we achieve this? Before I'm going to explain this one, let me show you one, the threat that rice is actually facing this day, that is threat from biotic, biotic and abiotic stresses. The measure are drought, flood, and some of the insects. And this thing is rather aggravated by the changing in the climate. I'm going to show it later, but let me show you one thing. Just how climate change can affect this thing is shown by the Stern Review of Economics on climate in 2006. They have shown one graph. That if global warming increased by one, one degree to three, de three degrees Celsius in the, in the globally, then this will significantly increase the number of storms, drought, and flood. This means rice is under severe threat, even if we assume the uh, no climate change in the future. Actually, some of the scientists in India, they have shown that it's already happening. For example, in India, in 1965, only three major insects were climbed. In India, but in 2011, they found a 14 kind of major insects in India. Mm -hmm. Another one thing I'm going to show you that the precipitation rate because of climate change is shown that from 1870 to 2020 until 1950, the annual rainfall in South East one of the provinces of India, was normal. But you can see from 1950 that it is below normal. I mean, most of the cases, precipitation rate is increasing. So these are all ones. Scenario that related to the climate change probably. The question is, let me sum up this first two slides. The demand for rice is increasing in the world, and it is a major struggle for around the globe. But the rice is under the productivity of rice is under severe threat because of climate change and because of biotin and abiotic stresses, which might be further aggravated because of climate change. The question is how can we face the challenges? How can we ensure the food security of the billions and the income of the million of for farmers. Maybe one of the important ways to build more climate resilient mathematics that we can work and sustain in the extreme climate scenario. There's more drought, which can resilient to more drought, more flood, and more uh, biotic stress and more. And by doing so, we can reduce heat loss, we can ensure sustainable income for the poor rice farmers, and we can ensure food security. In this case, I would like to mention that. We don't deny the development of high yielding variety, I mean super high yielding variety, but the experience shows that the such kind of variety is only, I mean, effective only in the favorable conditions, that is in the irrigated conditions. Maybe that kind of variety might not be sustainable in the case of global climate scenario, which predicts more flood, more drought, and more natural extreme events. But the thing is that the development and dissemination of that kind of new variety increases cost. I mean, the cost of research, I mean, laboratory research, extensive field trials in targeting countries, and the dissemination of that kind of variety, maybe through government or from NGOs or from private institutes. But the main point is it requires cost. The question is we must examine the benefit and cost of that kind of development of that kind of variety. And what might be the net benefit? How it might be changed the consumption and production pattern of a country, of a region, of a targeted region? And what might be the cost? Whether it is only to take that kind of in, I mean, investment or not, or that kind of research or not, that might be excellent. The prime objective of this paper, I mean, what we have done is to examine the ex-ante benefits and impacts of reading and disseminating a new drought and flood tolerant variety in South Asia. This is pretty ex -ante because this variety is not yet in the hand of farmers. Mm -hmm. And why we choose drought and flood and why we use South Asia, I'm going to explain in a few more slides. Let me start with the white drought and flood. Actually, drought and flood are two of the notorious abiotic stresses that cause, cause a significant heat loss around the globe. And that is the major culprit of volatile income of the four farmers. Around 43% of total rice farmland in the world is irrigated, I mean, rain fed rice farmland. And those are exposed to drought and flood. And out of 43%, around 38% of the area in the world is affected by drought. And India and China, two of the major rice producing countries in the world, they are the most sufferer for the drought. 
And 33% of the area that out of 43, 33% area is affected by flood. And most importantly, 31% of the area of 43% were affected by both twin problems, the drought and flood. And drought and flood it causes enormous losses of it ranging from 30% to 80% of losses. And in India, annual 30% of loss is only from drought. And it is said that in Bangladesh and India, annual yield loss for submergence is nearly 4 million tons, and that can feed 30 million people annually. So these are the losses. So that's why we target this only drought and flood. And then why South Asia? Because South Asia is the country it is a region that the major rice producing region in the world that produces 37%. And these are the countries, I mean, that the past area of land is exposed to drought and flood. For example, in entire South Asia, you can see from here that uh, in the world, total rice crop land is 154 million hectares. Out of that, 30.9% is rain fed lowland. And the countries in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, 60% is rain paid. And out of 60%, 42% in Bangladesh is rain fed lowland. And similar to India and Nepal and Sri Lanka. And you can also see the probability of drought here. This taken for fun there for. There's a high probability of drought in the region also at the same time. So why I choose drought and flood? Because these are the two of the notorious abiotic stresses that causes enormous in loss around the globe. And I choose South Asia as my sample countries, or sample region, because this is the major rice producing country in the area in the world that produces 37%. And the first majority of rice farm land in South Asia is exposed to drought and flood at the same time. That's a big problem. And another thing is, I mean, you know, mind that's why we choose uh, drought and flood because of the recent success of the breeders and scientists. Because breeders and scientists have already developed drought tolerant variety and submergence tolerant variety. So a combination of these two might be possible and feasible very short period of time. So that's why we choose this thing. And let me talk about our approach. Uh, you can ask me any question in the file if you need. I mean, if you have some burning question. Our approach is very pretty simple. We use Augustine model, partial equilibrium economic surplus model, considering South Asia as a whole is a large open economy. I will explain later what does it mean. And Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka as a small open economy. In this case, I exclude Pakistan because Pakistan, according to how that that all 100% area is irrigated. So I, I just I mean, exclude Pakistan from our model because we have some kind of ratio we use that how many percentages of area is irrigated or non irrigated in this model. We also use IGRM, that EV globalized model to assess the impact on production, consumption, trade, and prices in the sample South Asian countries as a whole, first as a jointly and separate area. The our process starts from the ORISA output, and we run virtual crop using ORISA 2000, using A2 climate scenario, that the worst case scenario in which the carbon concentration will be highest in the world. And that actually been there in 2011, in 20, 2100, that is the highest carbon concentration will be 750 ppm. In that scenario, we run the virtual crop model and we use a modified version of IR72 version. That is, modification was done by reducing drought sensitivity by 7% and allowing the root growth, root deepness by 40 to 50 centimeters. The data used is, in this case is from collected from CGM, that is global circulation model. And we use daily data from 2011 to 2050. And our run should we use also, also we use uh, the rainfall condition in South Asia, entire South Asia, and we, without any natural limitations. And our results show that significant yield gain over existing varieties. Okay? For example, in Asia, in entire South Asia, it is 2.8% in gain gain. And if we use this drought and submergence for an variety, and in here it reduces, I have some explanation for Dr. Lay. I will explain later if you have some question, but let me explain here that the Ukraine is substantial for South Asia and in the country as well, if you from horizon model. We plug in this model into, before that, I mean, yeah, we plug in this 
So these are people are uh, Alistair Martin and at the same time IGRN to get the impact on consumption, trade, production, and prices. But because that, let me show you the change. So this is, you can see in most of the cases, the yield gain is from 0 to 10%. 0 to 10% gain. During 2015 to 20, and next slide I'm showing you during 2035 to 40, but here, substantial yield loss in some areas. Ranging from minus 20 percent to zero. But these are the yeah, this, I have some explanation later, I will show you some details. But let me start with the Alistair model, what we did in this case. This pretty simple model, we have to look at the economy. This is a very simple micro economy, so it is we assume demand and supply. And we assume that the factory is some excess production. For example, this country initially they produce e wage zero amount of rice. They consume C A zero and they export C A one. C A zero to E value, this one's next so in this country, at price E zero. But because of the technology, as we show that the production has decreased, so supply drive decreased. I mean, supply drive shift in the right side. So production decreased now is E value one. And this country is exporting this much now. Of course, this much is equal to at price, it is a ski one because of supply increase. And this will increase the producer demand, producer supply at the same time, or demand supply. So this is the in one country because production has increased and prices have increased. And in this case, producers have a difficulty because of the decrease in production because they are in that not in they are in that situation. But only one sample will always be this is very basic model, what we use in case of these are the benefit and cost. And this is the some of the assumption we need to show. To calculate their benefit, the benefit, which is in other cases. We assume that the, the variety will come in the hand of the farmers in 2016. Actually, we hear that we already started developing and developing the new variety that is more easily to drop and plug at the same time. What that we call two human variety. It's already started. And we assume that the total cost of development and dissemination of this new variety will be 20 million US dollar. I mean, in South Asia. And we assume that the probability of success is eighty percent. And we we got some demand in the system supply electricity because obviously how much a country will export and how much a country will import depends on the electricity. And we got this from IGRA model. And here we also assume that the production cost I have to show here, the cost of production leak is a little bit because of the yield increase, because earlier it was Let's say washed out by flood, but now it will, it will be not. So we assume that the demand cost will increase at the same time. We are not in, including the efficiency of water use of those things. So, assuming all these things, we calculate net present value at 5% discount rate. It shows that India, 1 billion dollar rate, 1 billion, and then Nepal, this time is slow gets very low. And I have some information and I have some policy implications for Sri Lanka. But overall, the net present value is. Significantly high for these countries. If they are, if, I mean, after adopting the new variety that is developed by the variety, with very high and reasonable internet area. So, yeah, and we also did some kind of sensitivity test that uh, assuming the probability of uh, drought increase, let's say, probability of success increase, and let's say, uh, the discount rate has increased to 10 plus something like that. And in all sensitivity cases, and in all the analysis, they show that significant <coughs> in the form of the present value. Uh, in case of Sri Lanka, actually, it's a very, pretty small country, and only 25% of land area of Sri Lanka is exposed to drought and flood according to power sharing fees. So we went to one of the reasons why Sri Lanka shows a low IRR. <coughs> So in this case, I think the role of international organization like EDI might be important because there are small countries, small proportion, but actually those areas seriously inhibited by many poor people. So maybe international agency can play a very important role in this case. Let me show you the IGRM. So in using IGRM, we have shown here the changes in production. What will happen if we use or if we don't use the new variety? So this is the difference. It shows that production in India will increase by 3.9% if they pick the new heritage available in India. 
any violations, 5.28 percent. Consumption loss increase, and the price will increase. So this means a decrease in price because of the variety. It means poor people will be more affordable. Uh, it will create increase the affordability of poor people in the rise. So you have significant it might have significant impact on the health status of the poor people, at the same time nutrition status of the poor people. And I also show one study see here. That is about the trade. So you see Indian export will increase by 8.16 percent, but imports in Bangladesh will decrease by 183 percent. Actually, according to IGN projection, Bangladesh needs to import nearly 3 million ton in 2025. But adopting this variety, this import will decrease by this much. And most important part, the Sri Lanka, it will turn out as a surplus country, price surplus country. Of course, not need exporter because such a small amount is. And also, significant in total, the South Asia. Import will decrease by a significant amount. So uh, this is about this, and uh, um, at the point of my conclusion, so we showed that the rice is really important in the world because 200 million small farmers are producing 90 percent of the rice in the world, and uh, nearly 114 countries in the world. Uh, Cultivating rice, and it is in 159 million hectares of total land area is under cultivation. But rice and demand for rice is increasing in the world because of population pressure and because of income increase in many rice consuming countries. But the problem is the rice productivity and growth is under severe threat by many of the abiotic and micro stresses, and this it is further aggravated because of the change in the climate, the predicted change in the climate. So we have to develop kind of new variety of rice which can mitigate the situation, which can ensure the food security of the billions and income of the millions of poor rice farmers. In this case, we assume we propose a new variety that's more resilient to flood and drought. We use flood and drought to target because these are the two notorious MRG species that cause substantial illegals in not only in South Asia but in the globe as, as a whole. And we target South Asia because a vast majority of rice farmland in Asia, South Asia, is exposed to drought, drought and flood with high frequency of drought and flood and then with high probability of drought in South Asia. And we show that, of course, this development of this kind of new variety into a substantial amount of cost, but the development of the new variety can increase productive production of rice, consumption of rice, at the same time, it can decrease the rice prices in the sample countries. This means it has enormous impact on the food security at the same time on the affordability of the poor to the rice. So we suggest that strongly encourage policymakers and donors to fund the research, development, and dissemination of new rice varieties that are more resilient to climate change so that farmers can better cope with the changing climate scenario in the future. That's all about my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I'd like to just ask, maybe, oh, ask the question, and then I'll follow up with the question to address the other ones. Uh, I, I wonder, in, in terms of the, the calculations that you've done here, uh, you basically you, you presented the national level frequency uh, and then a portion of the rainfed area uh, yeah. that's affected. In any given drought year, only a portion of the Those areas that are uh, predominantly upland, uh, 
uh, and rank that lower than the word drop would be presumed to occur. Um, because uh, adding in also may be a cause for, for some overestimation. Then, then the third possible also cause of overestimation is if you converted this from a J chip to a K chip using the Alston et al. formulas, because you divide by the supply elasticity. And if you talk to someone like Abdul Pardee, he would say that you should never use a supply elasticity of, say, less than 0.5 uh, in, in making that, that shift, uh, that calculation from the J to the K shift, because things explode. Uh, because you divide this, your, your J shift, the supply shift, uh, by uh, the supply elasticity. So if you say you have a, an elasticity of 0.1, you multiply it tenfold uh, in your, your K shift. And I, I just wondered whether, uh, in, in terms of when you've gone through a J to from a, a J to a K to a K, uh, making that Yeah, thanks for that. Actually, let me start with the first answer. That uh, area. So we try to <coughs> locate uh, which area is really black hole, which is a drug hole. I went to GIS, but they don't have any data. So I end up with the the area, which is, yeah, I, I tried, I tried to get this information from the area, but I don't have it. There are some of them, 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 so what I end up with, the meetings, the meetings, the Personal conversation between me and Phil Pardee. Uh, uh, so they, basically, the thing is that they call like this is uh, set up to represent short term responses, so it may not reflect the long term responses. So I think we can use this, this information as our significant analysis. Yeah, in case the electricity supply by the wise fiber and then let's see what will happen. We can do that very fast. And that's nice. It's okay. It's probably okay. Uh, okay. On the question on the probability of, of drought, your question is uh, for every year, not all of the drought point area is actually affected by drought. That's correct. In, uh, in, a, drought. in a drought year. So, what, what we did is actually in the T shift formula add a probability of drought flood to sort of Mitigated. I, that's where that was our suggestion to me, actually. So we, we did include that to make it so the expected value of a benefit is tempered because of the probability of drought and, and flood not hitting that particular area in a particular year. So that's the, that's the way we sort of um, accounted for that in this particular thing. And then uh, we appreciate that comment on the T shift because actually we did just follow the awesome model dividing by the supply elasticity. But the problem we saw is that when you incorporate the actual case shift to the IGRM model, things explode. And, and that because of that, yeah, because of that. And so actually in the case in the IGRM model, we sort of just followed the the, the exact yield came from, from from Kyle's runs and then just uh, weighted it by the probability of drought and by the area. Uh, the rate of adoption. So that's why the IGRM didn't explode using some of the data that we used in, in the uh, the surface model. Uh, yeah, uh, just add one, one point, just something that we I, I would say that the GIS lab does have data on this. Uh, and, and we, we actually have a possible work with, with, uh, uh, with the GIS lab in part to put together some of the data on this. I mean, basically, you need three parameters. You need uh, the prone area for the stress. Uh, you need the frequency of the stress, and you need the average proportion of the prone area affected in the years when the stress occurred. Those, those are basically the three parameters that you need. So even if you have a rate of lowland requirement, 
actually is about the predictive yield we use from the ORISA model. Can you share us uh, the rationale behind the assumptions we use? Uh, you can show us the assumptions. Why is it 7%? Why not 5% or 10%? And was there an additional assumption for flooding when you do uh, the prediction for two-in-one variety? Actually, the guru is here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, basically, we use Verizon and we use CGM climate data every year, uh, uh, every part day. And uh, we use different scenarios. So, that's what I can explain. You. But why 7%? I like to leave this. The different percentage increase or decrease is totally dependent on the precipitation channels and the distribution pattern. So, for example, in some areas, we will see some even some yield decrease because uh, uh, the rainfall it comes in the early of the growth period. So, the developments large amount of the biomass. Um, and also the depleted the soil water. Then they shift into the reproductive state because the soil water is too nice. They even suffer super drought stress in there. So the large biomass does not convert to the green yield. So that's the US system, yield nodes. So uh, because this is of the difference, very localized, very, very local condition. So that will uh, result in different increase or different uh, equation. We will see the map. So uh, uh, we, we see the map in the north, north of, of, the, of the south side charts, normally it gets low thinning. In the south part, you will uh, show you less thinning. And however, so for the crop modeling works, we always have the minimum assumption. For example, and for this uh, uh, modeling work, we do not have the data for the ground uh, work level. So we just assume all ground work level is below the two meters. So uh, this is because we do not have the, the data. We just make it uniform. Uh, and the, the soil data, we are we don't have the exact uh, soil data from every grid cell. So the, the, the soil data is uh, interpreted from the available soil profile data. So all this kind of so will cause some error in the law. But anyhow, we can only do the profit modeling, uh, modeling works based on available, uh, available data. Ask me any other 
Have you ever thought if the shell exists or the feasibility of this type of variety? Yes, yes, yes. So that's what I said in my motivation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'm s
And then if if we possible, we have information. Multiplying by the cloud probability and multiplying by the atom on base. In this way, I can have the idea. Otherwise, if I just input all those species, it's just possible. So, maybe we can work on later. Yes. Yeah. 
think it would be safe for us to be able to gain from the first group. But it would be possible if one wanted to to run it so that you're only looking at the pixels that have a rainfall deficit and you're looking at the effects there. Because that would be a better way to it. But using the data you already have from the rest of the world, you run out of that Yeah, that's what the way we need to go back to the Okay, uh, so I, I think that runs out of questions. Um, I thank uh, Martha Lett for the seminar. I think we've had an interesting uh, discussion today. Uh, it was nice to see in the seminar that we had plenty of time for discussion. Uh, and so I thank everyone also for attending. Thank you very much.